may well be for great details. What could be the possible solution? So, and then uh, after that, we will get one thing of the problem, which is called the problem. Okay. So, today, uh, I'll discuss two things, actually. Second, I mentioned it briefly about gauge coupling So you, I said that there is a communication that we have to do some. Theoretically, there were some indications. I don't. I wrote down few theoretical problems, and then there is some strong signal. Here I mention a few things uh, gauge coupling indication and parameter. I will describe what this is and then I will go to particle diagram. These two things I want to do because I am going step by step. Let me modify this. I wrote it as gauge coupling indication. But I just say about parameter. There is strong CP problem, and what was this thing? Uh, this one obviously finished. Okay. So these two are left actually. Variables is essentially a matter and matter symmetry. Uh, okay. So oh, no, this is not it. I'm sorry. So these two we'll try to cover today. Now, uh, so in general, I mentioned that uh, there are indications that there could be a use case uh, beyond the standard model when you look at the parameters of the standard gauge coupling. Gauge coupling. So the gauge couplings, as we know, in a Quantum field theory depend upon the scale at which you are measuring. Okay, they keep modifying the scale at which they are measuring. So you renormalize it at a particular scale. Typically, you define it a particular renormalization scheme, which is called MS bar scheme. Okay, so under MS bar scheme, alpha i MS bar. So you take alpha 3, okay, you measure it. These have not been, uh, there has this idea that. Uh, alpha 3 has not been measured, but right from. Okay, so it is dependent upon the, the scale you have measured. But these numbers are not known for a while, actually. For a long time, it was not known. But we could start with extrapolating them to high scale. So, how far you can go is the question that when it becomes non perturbative, that means this should be perturbative, right? Essentially, we wanted to see why this was interesting is because. Uh, the evolution of gauge coupling was interesting because you wanted uh, the forces to become weaker, in, especially for QCD, the forces to be weaker with higher energies. So you wanted a theory in which the force becomes weaker at higher with higher energies. At the same time, in the uh, electromagnetic interactions, the, the result is opposite. The force becomes stronger as we go higher and higher. Energy. As you go closer to the charge, the force becomes stronger. So that is the reason why we started actually using the Darwin equation. We wanted to see how this, uh, the, uh, the, the force moves in the RG as the force changes, okay? How the force changes with respect to the energy scale at which we are measuring these things. So uh, this uh, combining, so individually if you were looking at alpha 3, alpha 2, combining all the three, Was, I think I already mentioned it, it was done by Helen Finn. George I and Weinberg in 
the late 70s. So in the late 70s, early 90s, they actually started looking at these things. But the experiment left started measuring them very, very precisely. So the left experiment from the late 90s, early 90s. So the early 90s, we started seeing this at a scale around the mu is equal to 91.2 degrees, 91 whatever it is. Okay, at the z pole, you could measure this uplink pretty precisely in a quadratic fashion. Okay, and of course there are other uh, uh, aspects of measuring. So you had something like this is around the point. So you need to have these measurements pretty, pretty precisely. So don't take this numbers very seriously, but so <laughs> okay, I wrote it from memory, but I just check it actually. Okay, yeah. Uh, so this is GS square by four pi. Why do you write in terms of alpha? Because this is the uh, order of magnitude for uh, when you expand any amplitude, and the amplitude is expanded in terms of alpha, not in terms of g. The amplitude is expanded in terms of powers of alpha. So there's a reason why we write g square by 4 pi. That's how we do the perturbation. Now, so you have these numbers for these parameters. And then when you plot it, this I have told you several times that at scales close to uh, around 10 power 14 GB, 10 power 14 to 10 power 15. you seem to be having uh, a rough unification of this. So this triangle, they don't completely unify because these numbers are now very precisely measured of the order of percentage level. You can show actually now people claim that standard model does not unify the base properties. They don't unify these base properties because you can put them at the root level, these are the equations containing the information from the cock of units and so on so okay. So you solve them at two loop level and then put standard model thresholds exactly, the top mass, bottom mass, further length, and then do this calculation very precisely. This started this game of precision unification started in the early 19th century. Okay? So when they started this doing precision unification, They started getting a number around this, around the triangle, where then it doesn't unify. So earlier, which was considered as a signature for a grand unification theory, now you start claiming that the standard model is at fault because it doesn't precisely unify the gauge coupling. So earlier you were saying that okay, there is an indication for a new scale and everything, so the gauge coupling is unified, all that was good. But now with precision measure calculations and precision calculations, they don't unify. Now you say this is a fault of the standard model. The standard model has particle spectrum and the values of these coupling are such that the gauge coupling is not precisely. You say the unification is out by some more than five sigma. Okay. So you say that they don't unify more than five sigma. No, because you are in precision physics, you can claim sigmas and everything, and you can say that they don't unify. Okay. So this earlier, which I presented as something which is some useful thing, has become some sort of an, uh, um, a negative point for the standard. Okay. Okay. So this unification of the triangle shows that there is no <laughs> So people started looking at alternatives in which it can be shown precisely that if you want precision unification in standard model, 
you need to have a new microphone. If you want precision communication, okay, you need to have some matter at scale, some scale, okay, whatever scale you want, some matter you have, okay, and it should be of the right type, such that the application could have. Adding an extra generation will not help the application. Yeah. Why do you want the multiplication? Why do you want the multiplication? Okay, like I said yesterday, that uh, you want gauge coupling is unified, you can replace it with the KV, which is very uh, multi brand which can explain it. After the chemistry, this can go... Ah, if you want precise unification, so let's say that there is a precise unification. So G3 of alpha 3, alpha S or alpha 3 is equal to alpha... Tilda means another 4-5, okay? So this is equal to alpha 1. If there is such a thing, then I can have one unified theory with a single coupling constant. Because grand unified theory has a one single coupling constant. So you can match it with a grand unified theory. That's the reason why I am doing that. This is actually a normalization of that. We will see it when we come to that. Uh, if you have it's roughly 1 by 24 in some place. If you want the value, tell me. It's not for any way because it changes. So the basic idea is that if you have exact matching at that scale, you can match it with one single theory, which is one single So if you think of a theory like SO5 or SO10 or something, any grand unified theory, it has only one coupling. Now this one coupling constant covers all the three interactions. So standard mode is not a really unifying theory. You have only one alpha vector, which is actually a really unifying theory. And this has to come down back to, it has to reproduce back QCD, QD and also the V interactions. So if this matching is not precise, if you want everybody is away from unification, depending upon the kind of model you choose or something, if it is away from unification by several sigmas, say for example, then no uh, simple look effects will not work. I mean, what I mean to say is simple look effects. Simple threshold corrections at this gut scale will not lead to uh, this kind of a uh, what you call discrepancy. Because they don't really unify. They have something called unification triangle. I don't touch the box. In this box, they go away then. It's something like that. So they don't really unify. They come together and then. You can go let some higher thing you have. So at the, at the next scale, you want to do a matching. These three theories you want to do a match with them. It's like an effective theory, you know. I mean, standard model you consider as an effective theory. It's renewable theory. You want to match it with a full theory, and then you have to match parameter by parameter, coupling by coupling. Okay. So when you do that matching, you won't be able to do it if this is not precise. These three equations. You want to. You don't have a proper boundary condition. In other words, okay. For this, did it answer your question or? Did Why do you want to process uh, Oh, uh, you mean in general, essentially. Yes. In general, why do you want to process No, if it is uh, uh, okay, it's a philosophical idea. Like, for example, like I said, that there is a hierarchy of resources. Now, you, you want to explain, I'll come to the other hierarchies also in the of the So, there is a hierarchy of process. So, you want to understand whether this are dynamically generated by a single force, or they are really different kind of theory. Because all of the three are explained by the same quantum theory type structure. So these are explained by the same quantum theories like various theories. Okay? Electromagnetic theory, okay, uh, weak interactions and uh, 
UCD. All of them are explained by the same quantum theories. So they have the same mathematical structure except some uh, some matter representations and other things. They have the same matter structure. Then at the level uh, at this scale, the differences is also not so different. Okay, they are Lyapunov's group. All the three are Lyapunov's group. Okay, so why they look so different at this scale? When their uh, their energy scale and everything is so close by, essentially. So you want a reason why this hierarchy may be looking very different. Forget about gravity because its hierarchy is too much, essentially. So these three, the hierarchy is not so significant. Okay. So you want a thing that you want to directly explain that if you have, perhaps it's a single theory, single uh, coupling constant. Which is giving you these hierarchies as it evolves downstream, as it evolves through these gates. So all of them may be one single gauge uh, gauge gauge theory or a single gauge theory. They are manifesting differently at the weak scale. Okay, starting with single. That's the reason all the forces may not be very different. Okay. Did it answer your question? So they have. You should remember that they are all three quantum field theories of the same type. Three quantum field theories of the same type, and you assume that they have, it has a similar Okay, all the three it has a similar I am not going to because there is something called a simple safety versus a simple freedom, and so on. And so on. But let's just say that this really has a simple freedom. Here, here, uh, what do you call weak interactions? Just stay flat. Whereas electromagnetic interaction start increasing, essentially. start increasing, but at some point they essentially become flat. They start increasing, they have a Landau cone at a very high level, far beyond the flat state. So, you want uh, some sort of uh, explanation that you want to get one single thing, but if you want to have a unified picture of all the forces so that you can explain. Why there is a hierarchy between these three forces? Okay, why there is a hierarchy between these three forces? You won't be able to do it in standard. You won't be able to do it in standard. So you can ask more deeper questions. So in a way, you can ask why the parameters themselves are of this type. So, this is influenced more from um, string theory. In which the coupling constants are essentially fields at any maximum expansion. Okay, you can assume that uh, there is no real coupling constant essentially. Okay, if we have a quantum theory of gravity or something, the coupling constant is not really a coupling some sort of a field, essentially. It gets its value, some some field getting a vacuum expectation value gives you some coupling constant. Could be something called a dialectic field or whatever it is, essentially. Okay, some field which is getting, uh, let me write it as something, okay. some field getting a vacuum expectation value. So this field, by some point, so this one would assume to be this coupling constant to be inclined in its type set or alpha plan. You can also in supergravity in string field you can set m plan constant to be equal to one. So you work in plan <laughs> units. Okay. So okay. Yeah, so anyway, so you assume that all the alphas, all the parameters in the field to be one on one. You assume, you should say, you expect. All the alphas to be on one. For this reason, you would say, okay, this is what another, it's not a deep reason, like the hierarchy of the forces. Explaining hierarchy of the forces is important. It's a valid question. Why weak interactions are stronger than strong electromagnetic interactions? That's, or electromagnetic interactions are stronger than weak interactions. That's a valid question. Okay? Why they are, so you, if you ask that question, why strong interactions are stronger than. Uh, Say weak interactions. So that is a valid question. Now, 
Here I'm arguing that, okay, in some theories, here I'm motivating a different reason. So it's not as strong a question as this reason. But if you believe that there is some sort of history of theory and so on, so on, and in which all the complaints are coming from it has some constants of some field, essentially, a vacuum special of some field, you would expect all the alphas to be automatic. All the couplings of the field to be Okay? Now this is not exactly valid, essentially, also. Okay? This is also not exactly valid in this time. So you need to explain why the hierarchy of the couplings is happening. You need to have a, some sort of a dynamical explanation why these couplings are having. Because the back scale is also sitting very close to the string scale, we can expect that this back coupling is coming from some string theory. Okay? I won't close the entire thing, essentially. How you want to So if the gut theory is coming from some sort of a gut coupling is coming from some direct or something or some, some coupling constant. Okay. okay. It is some vacuum expectation of some coupling. And then this runs down, this runs down to giving you this pattern. So this is the whole picture you want to build. But if you want to fit it into the picture, you want this to be valid very accurately, which is not possible. So the whole picture you want to build is that so there is some string theory and then it gives you some sort of a, a coupling constant of one one okay, for a dynamic fat theory and this dynamic fat theory then dynamically evolves to give you three coupling constants which are hierarchical. Uh, that's how you perceive why the weak interactions are so weaker than say strong interactions and so on. So you will Terminologically, we know why weak interactions should be stronger than uh, strong interactions should be weaker than uh, weak interactions because they had to bind together. Okay, four stronger than electromagnetic forces, so they had to bind uh, neutrons and protons together, so they should be very very strong force. So empirically we know, but mathematically we don't know because we don't have an explanation because all of them have the same one of the three structures. So would we write that right inside? Because I can also explain that. So then we are already assuming that the limitation has happened. So then this is not beyond limitation. This is close to the plan scale. So it's not like different fields, there is a special value between different couple constants. It's not like that. No. So one field that one field is giving you some uh, the assumption is that there is one field you have can have models actually in which one field gives a vacuum expectation value, which is equivalent to the dynamic fed couple constant, which then runs down. This entire thing can be set up to infinite string or string inspired dynamic Why can't we, like, there, there is a different, like, so if you said this five sigma different in the standard model. So maybe more, more, more than, than yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, so why can't we have a, like, two uh, field at the, uh, like, beyond that scale, and which is, like, uh, merging at the highest scale? Uh, like okay. Uh, all this thing, I can, there is a counter example. Okay, <laughs> I, I can give you a counter example. Okay, uh, now there are some random factor theories which are called S Okay, S uh, uh, to so th th this is a standard law essentially. The assumption, there are several quote unquote assumptions actually. Uh, I, it's hard to, because I want you to give you, I, want, I don't want to influence one particular feature. Let's go through it. Now suppose, I don't say, uh, now typically I said that within the standard model you don't need to, you don't unify, you don't exactly unify, so you put in some extra particles here, say for example, supersymmetry. Supersymmetry precisely unifies, almost exactly unifies. So that's the reason it solves the hierarchy problem. So it gives you correct unification. It fits very naturally in superstring theory because superstring theory has supersymmetry. So, supersymmetry is some sort of a prediction of string theory, essentially. So, it falls everything perfectly. That falls, the entire picture falls completely. Okay? But you can say that, okay, let's forget that there is supersymmetry, there is string theory, everything has to be everything. 
but is there a unification cost still? non super symmetric unification is still possible? So the answer is yes, it's possible. So if we have, um, so instead of one Higgs boson, if you have four Higgs bosons in the standard model, you can still have unification and dispersion. Okay, so even if you don't have four Higgs bosons, say for example, if I add standard model plus three more extra Higgs fields, I can have unification in a model which is not exactly SU5 but called SO10. That kind of models are allowed. SO10 has CISO mechanism, it fits very naturally in neutrino masses. We forget about hierarchy problem, but it's very good. Okay, counter example. So SO10 has two counter examples. Four to six, I think, if I remember, I don't remember the upper number. If you add more than four, say for example, okay, number of these bosons can you look at? So what are threshold corrections? Threshold corrections are, uh, suppose if you are calculating everything in some particular renunciation scheme or regular scheme, so you are in conscious scheme. Okay, typically, you understand what is renowned as an onshell scheme. Okay. Onshell scheme means mass of the particles itself. But if you, you typically calculate gauge couplings and everything in MS bar scheme. Okay. So, in MS, so if you want to move from one scheme to another, you have some corrections to add. So, you have some extra corrections to add. These are typically called as threshold corrections. So, whenever a particle is decoupling, okay, whenever a particle is decoupling, Okay, for example, uh, if you have the top mass, so you are running from say mz to standard mass, and then the top mass mass is around 100, say 100, 200 g. Around 200 g, there is a finite contribution to the RG equation. Finite contribution. It's called a threshold correction. So there is a finite. See, RG equation is sensitive to the high scale, so it is sensitive to the infinite part of the denomination essentially. Whereas the finite parts are essentially called threshold corrections. Okay, finite parts are typically called corrections. So if you have a theory with very large, very large thresholds here, and these thresholds are suitable that they twist this unification, <laughs> uh, twist this unification can lead to unification theory. So in an SO10 theory, close to unification Now you can 
argue that this is quite clear because you are choosing the spectra of S410, okay, mass, pattern, everything, such a way that it gives you exact indication. So, if you want, uh, there is this famous paper by Primus and Wolfenstein. Uh, no, uh, So, then what happens is, uh, so you start having uh, threshold corrections just below the 10 power 16 GE or something. Okay, 10 power, I think in 10 power it's very old because it's not 15 GE. So, this coupling will start moving like this. This will start moving like this. This will start moving like this. So, if you zoom it in, it will be some such thing. So, should be smooth, some such weird shape of the running of the gauge couplings. Okay, it be some weird shape, but that at the end of the day, what will be the shape they unify? They unify exactly. Okay, the threshold corrections can twist completely change the slope of the running. Okay, but then at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what it is, but they lead to unity. So Okay. Now, either way, either you add new physics at very, very high scale, okay, as in S4 10, or at the weak scale, or you add some symmetry and everything like in pseudo-symmetric theories or something. Either way, exact unification is not possible in this and it doesn't fit in with the ideas of unification. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's only with one thing is possible. Yeah. Now we are adding two more. Mm -hmm. Does the set self coupling and those things also go to Right. It depends upon the mass of coupling because there are several self couplings. Okay. So there are several couplings. I don't know if somebody has looked into this whole Higgs coupling. Okay. With the complete, at the precision level when I mentioned that result. Okay. That result is at an extremely bright, high precise result. Free loop, gauge couplings, two loop, power couplings, and you know, two loop threshold connections to the gauge couplings, and one loop threshold to the power couplings. At that level, nobody has re looked at uh, this kind of models, whether unification is still possible, and whether some, if some lambdas go negative or something. It's a very good question. I don't know if somebody has looked at it. After the Higgs uh, discovery and these calculations of Higgs stability. Whether all the lambdas are positive, because if none of the lamb, if some lambdas are not positive, then this result is not valid. Okay. But if some, if all the lambdas should be positive, because there are several lambdas now. Okay. Because uh, there is x one, x two, x two, so several lambdas. That's a very valid question. I don't know if there is an answer. It is still valid at that precision level. So before uh, <coughs> then approximately all the numbers are like positive. There is only one number. Yeah, it's a two Higgs dominant model. Um, when we do it, we will see what that that lambda is essentially G square. So it's always possible. So the coupling is always G square. There's only one lambda. So it's a very, very highly constrained two Higgs dominant model. Okay. That's the reason why it's super symmetry constrained with the Higgs mass. Okay. Because it's equal to a known quantity which is actually for a complex square mass or I'm just so if everything becomes predictable this way. So you can actually predict the Higgs mass and then match that. Which is not possible in uh, say generic to Higgs order. In generic to Higgs order model you have five uh, lambdas and so you can have 
five free parameters, five free masses. One of them you can just do these ones and another four are free. But let's not do this again. So, um, these days, okay, these, uh, now there is also this another philosophical question which people used to worry a lot, essentially. Um, when I said gauge coupling has parameters, is that uh, so, the standard model has Yukawa couplings. The wide range. So, starting from Yp to of the order of the, uh, 1, all the way up to Yd to of the order of 10 power minus 6. So, you fill in all the blanks. So y e is very small, 10 power minus 6, and if you have neutral masses, we saw it already. So even this is a very large hierarchy, which is 6 orders of magnitude per couple. So why there is a hierarchy in the power couplings? Why there are three generations? We can explain why there are three generations for some reason. Some empirical reason we don't touch. But we don't have a reason why these Sika couplings are so uh, placed in such a way. There is no dynamical explanation. There is no uh, theoretical explanation for why these are. You know, phenomenologically, these are the numbers. But why these couplings take these numbers is not clear. As an empirical theory, it works very well. These numbers fit the data. These numbers fit the theory. But theoretically, we have no explanation. When I say theoretically, we have no explanation again. I'm starting by saying that. Theoretically, you expect all the couplings to be odd one. Okay, you should expect all the couplings to be odd one if you want, uh, because you want uh, because of the structure of the quantum field theories. Essentially, you will expect them to be odd one. But then these couplings are completely random. Essentially, they are between. So you have no idea why these are like this, why their uh, masses are odd in this one. Okay, why? Say, for example, CK has this structure. Why CK has this structure? No, we, have. we, we don't have the linear explanation within the context of standard model why the CK has this structure. So, if you want a proper unified theory, what you would expect is essentially you have only one field for the coupling. All the couplings of the theory should be given by one field. If you believe in a super string theory or something, so essentially there should be only one coupling, which is the expectation, only one parameter should explain all the things. But it has so many parameters, phenomenological parameters. So it loses its in a sense its predictive. Like for example, you cannot predict the hidden mass of standard masses. You cannot predict the top quote mass. You cannot predict any masses in standard. As a quantum field theory, you will not be able to play uh, any role. If your theory wants predictivity, it should have as few number of parameters as possible. But if you have a large number of parameters of the order of 20 parameters, it's not theoretically very appealing. Okay? So you would want a theory which gives you very few number of parameters, which can explain all the features of this, all the dynamics on the world. But so far, for every physics beyond standard model, we only increase the number of parameters, but not decrease. <laughs> for every physics beyond standard model, as far as I know. Okay, everything, you take any model you choose, okay, except some specific models, I think, very important. Those don't work. The ones in which the parameters are very few, if they don't work, actually. But every other field model you can think of, we explain utterly that to build a theory, Fewer number of parameters, so you don't. Uh, let's not uh, worry about this too much, actually. So, okay. But let's remember that there is this issue with standard model. Okay. Let's remember that it has too many parameters. On the order of twenty, when a good theory losing its predictive power. But if you have fewer parameters, 
create a safe like when you look back with them. The quest was for a physics girl standard model with a pure parameter. Would be good. And if we can explain I mean, why these parameters take those values and so on, so we can explain that. But I said, we failed miserably in this cycle, as far as I can understand. I cannot think of something which has very few parameters. So, but let's remember this as something. Actually, in the old uh, supersymmetric planning for theories, they could manage to build models with very few parameters, but all of them are good. Old supersymmetric land for the physics and so on and so forth. I don't remember anything which is valid now. They had theories with very, very few parameters and everything. Okay, but now they are all gone actually. You cannot see them out there. You can build them, but very, very, very high theory. So, so Okay, now we'll come to one phenomenological reason why we want to go with the John Sand model, which essentially it's a tough matter. All of you are experts on this. I don't have to mention it much. So in particular, as far as we are interested in physics block standard model and other things, okay, we are interested in a particle interpretation. Interested in astrophysical interpretations. <laughs> <coughs> so, which particle, or we, should we need a new particle beyond the standard model? If so, what its features are? So, how does it fit naturally? Okay. And so on. So, the reason why we need to think of the existence of beyond standard. So there is uh, tremendous evidence for dark matter. It's there at all scale, from starting with clusters. So by Zwicky, he just used the virial theorem and showed that. Okay, so he used the virial theorem and showed that the mass within inside a, a galaxy, a galaxy cluster. Should be roughly 10 times that more than its visible mass. So he got a mass discrepancy of the order of 10. <laughs> Compared to visible mass. Actually, this roughly holds even the order 1. Around factor six, okay. if you take the most precise uh, CMB, visible to uh, dark matter is around factor six. Then uh, this was forgotten. This was in 1930. People completely forgot about it. And they said that uh, the telescope must be bad. Or something. <laughs> okay, these calculations are wrong, or whatever. They really, really take it seriously, just like they didn't take Newton or Martin seriously for that. Okay. But then, uh, where are Rubin? Started looking at galactic rotation curves. It's not even a proper astrophysics journal or something. So. Okay. so she started looking at galactic rotation curves at the, uh, and then applying again the, uh, the video theorem and trying to put in uh, of visible matter. 
So what she found was that the rotational curves, if you take this to be the back, this way, this way. Uh, the rotation curves essentially are flat. Up to what distance you measure? So whatever measurement you do up to here, whatever here. Even of the 100 kb, the flat. The 20 is the visible depth, this essentially, of the galactic curve. Now, if you follow Newtonian dynamics, the rotational curve will, should fall off some kind of rotation. Okay? If this is just the visible matter, So, but there seem to be something. So, if you fit in visible matter plus dark matter, so we should be able to. We don't know what the dark matter at very low resistance is, but we will say that some distribution is there. So, if you add dark matter here, so you seem to be pretty good. So, this is expected from just Newtonian dynamics. And only visible matter which satisfied the Newtonian dynamics. And you got this point. All these guys are experts on that matter, so we don't have to worry about this side of the table. Okay. <laughs> this stuff is like that, but it is. So this is just linear time. M omega square, okay, the m squared by r is equal to g m by r. Imagine each of them. And then calculate what is v. Okay, what is v? Okay. Now this is only true for some, some class of galaxies called spherical galaxies, essentially. Spherical rotational galaxies. Now, if you have elliptical galaxies, say for example, they don't satisfy, they will not be dark matter dominant or something, they will not have dark matter. They are all having pressure dependent, uh, they are all essentially, uh, they balance their gravity with pressure. Okay. So, they are not, so the, here the balance of the gravity is given because of the rotation. So, you can actually uh, match the uh, gravitational potential with the uh, gravitational energy with the uh, rotation. So you match these two. But if you are if you are uh, balancing against gravity, not by rotation curves, but by pressure or something, it looks like we don't need that matter. We don't know whether it's positive or negative. We don't know much about them. Okay, these are called they are called elliptical galaxies. We just about them. They are balanced with pressure. So these are specifically you see figures of galaxies which are like green shapes or something beautiful. So you see these rotation curves going all the way, and if there is some component like dark matter, now this can fit in here. So up to here we have optical ablation. Here we have something radio ablation. This is the neutral hydrogen radio ablation. Okay. So you take uh, radio observations and then okay. this has been possible again from nuclear physics. <laughs> you have atomic hydrogen absorption. This uh, this part I teach it again and again in uh, quantum mechanics three course, relativistic quantum mechanics. If there is no relativistic quantum mechanics, you don't have fine structure constant. And if you don't have fine structure constant, you don't have spin one cent button and something, which you can measure this side. So these operations show you this one. Okay. Uh, so how do you explain this? You explain this by putting so the dark matter uh, is considered to be neutral, 
collision lens. Say neutral collision lens. If it's not neutral, you should be able to see the visible disk. It should be fluid, essentially like a fluid, essentially. It should be uh, uh, collision lens in the sense that it should not. Uh, uh, it's not uh, many. It's not producing a lot of uh, pressure or something. Essentially, okay. it is like a fluid which is not having a lot of viscous force or something. Okay, it doesn't have anything like that. Okay, it has something, but we'll come to that example. Okay. So, uh, it doesn't have strong interactions between them. There are no strong interactions. Okay. People are testing everything. Each of them, there are people testing, uh, making the limits on it. Which engulfs the galaxy. Which is, if there's a galaxy like this, which has a disk or something, so you have some dark matter around it, around some envelope of dark matter. So you have the galaxy. What you see as Milky Way is this, but actual Milky Way is containing also the dark matter which envelops it completely, okay. which we don't see. Which we don't see. It's very low dense, extremely low density. So on so forth. So there's a huh? It's spherical or in a disk. But because it's gravity, it's center force, we believe it's some sort of spherical or so on. We don't know the shape or something. I don't know if it's spherical or so We actually don't. There could be, see what happens is uh, people are now actually looking at uh, more details. This study is something called satellite galaxies around here and try to get to what is the structure of that or what is the profile of the dark matter around here. So it cannot be an exact uh, spherical thing. It may change depending upon if some gravitational bodies are here or something. Some small galaxies are here. So there are something called dwarf galaxies and satellite galaxies. So these are small galaxies which, which are like satellites of this galaxy. So the galaxy can have its own satellite. So, what kind of a particle it could be is one question. So, there is also one more most important thing. If it is a particle, the moment you assume that it is a particle, and most important thing is that it should be spin. So this is very an important uh, uh, property of the dark matter. It should be stable, but especially for particles, because if it has an astrophysical explanation, okay, so you don't worry about it. So one of the first astrophysical explanations were essentially called Mond. Modified Newtonian value given by Will Brown. Okay. So modified Newtonian dynamics says that okay, at certain distance, after certain distance, the idea here is there's no dark matter. Okay, there's no dark matter, and all the observations are such that at a certain distance, there's an extra term in the Newtonian potential. Which is repulsive nature, not entire. So the idea is to so it gives some scale. From that scale, gravity will start repulsing. So you have okay. So for each galaxy, you can have some sort of universal. So I think right now, as far as last know, you guys know better than me, that there are about 100 rotation curves we have seen in collectively measured them and 
budget and the tax system comes. So you can try to fit in what the all of them. Okay. So I think it is universal. People can actually try to fit in universality, and then people try to start looking at whether mod can come from fundamental theories or something. Okay. So gravity becomes uh, attractive. So it attracts matter, and then it starts repulsing. And so the matter is driven away from you. That's the basic. Thing. But then I don't have slides to show, but uh, there is this nice. Uh, I I recommend all of you to go and see this nice simulation put up by these people. Okay, so there is this thing which killed more. Which is called bullet cluster. So the alternative to dark matter was called mod, as I said. You know, we say that there is no dark matter, but Newton's law itself is mod, right? Marin. Okay. But this was killed by an observation called bullet cluster. So bullet cluster, essentially, what it see was that uh, this was Hubble. This is actually Hubble, Chandra, a number of observations. So several observations put together. Okay, gravitational lensing, strong and weak gravitational lensing, both of them. So they put together, and uh, what they observed was essentially that uh, they observed a collision of two galaxies. It's not exactly a collision after month after collision. Okay, it's not. Okay. So they see something like this, and then. Some sort of a jet like this, which is protruding it, and here there is some visible matter. So, a, a, a cluster of galaxy going to another cluster, but it is going through some sort of like a bullet like structure. Like this, like this. Okay. So, the basic idea is that you have two galaxies, but then when you map the gravitational potential. When you map, map the gravitational potentials, this is the visible thing in X-rays and all these things. The gravitational potentials look like this. The center of gravity is here. So visibly you see something like this, but from gravitational lensing, you see two huge blocks here. So, uh, if you want to see the simulation, it's very nice. Actually, go and see the simulation. So the way you see it is that you have two small clusters, say for example, here, each with its own dark matter cloud. Okay, each with its own dark matter cloud. It goes to each other. When it comes out, this cluster hits with this cluster. And when it's going through it, it forms this kind of a bullet cluster, the visible thing, okay, the bullet like shape essentially. But these are collisionless dark matter cones. They just stay there. They just go there, but they don't really see. I mean, there's no strong interaction between them, so they are just there. But they can be seen gravitationally, so you can map their gravitation potential. I wish I could show that thing, but uh, unfortunately I cannot show. But I advise all of you to see this thing. So the main point here is that the visible center of the mass is different from the gravitational center of the mass. So if you want the center of mass of this visible structure, so in X-rays and all these things, it is actually at a very different point. You say this is the only thing in this point, but when you do gravitational lensing, you will start seeing the potential, okay, far away from the visible structure, far away from the visible structure by using gravitational lensing. Now this you cannot explain by mod. This you cannot explain by mod. Okay, why the gravitational potential is so far off? Okay, when you are, I mean, by repulsion you cannot explain. 
So this cannot be explained by bond, and that is precisely the reason bond was highly dissipated. So this sort of put dark matter in a much much stronger footing, essentially that there should be dark matter in the universe rather than bond. You guys can correct me if I am wrong or something. Essentially, okay, yeah, okay. So this. Is called so called the bullet cluster. Now, after a bullet cluster, there was one more. I don't remember the naming of uh, this galactic name so from NJ plus plus something something dot dot something NJ. So, this formed one more unit which is very similar. Okay, they formed one more Mac J or something something. Is it, is it, okay? So, there is one more unit. They formed similar events actually, few events. I remember at least one definitely, which has uh, where the center of gravity is again very far from the center of gravitational potential is very far from the visible center of cosmic potential, which also cannot be explained. Through. There has been ideas about reviving bond by something else actually. Okay. They have a modified bond, super modified bond actually, which can explain this. They won't explain this thing, but I think Wittgenstein proposed the relativistic bond and stuff like that. But for all practical purposes, we can forget about bond. So we say believe in dark matter. So dark matter exists. Now, how do you find it? Okay, that is the main problem. <laughs> okay. So that is the main issue actually. But for us in this course, we worry about what is it. It cannot be modified gravity, it cannot be anything else, it has to some support. <coughs> this bullet cluster, S5 bullet cluster, and uh, look into Paper, the guys who wrote this paper, the interpretation paper, they also released a simulation. Okay, have a look at this simulation, it's fantastic. Okay. And I advise all of you to do it. Okay. This is one of the fantastic results. Okay, so then there is finally using data from supernova one way. And Kobe W man a model of cosmology has been built. So this thing called lambda CDM became, became possible, a model of possible. Now what they do is essentially they have measurement from a type 1 supernova essentially, which tells you what is the, uh, you try to fit the data for type 1 supernova assuming some possible, all problems of water fermented cancer, but with very, with very minor densities. How much is the dark matter content? How much is the matter content? How much is a constant called uh, called the cosmological constant? Essentially. You vary these things and start putting the data essentially. And then this was verified by measurement of anisotropies in cosmic microwave magnetism. So, the cosmic microwave background is essentially uniform, completely uniform. You measure the temperature of the photons which were left after the Big Bang. So, this Big Bang is not, uh, this Big Bang means you start at around uh, MEV temperature. You start with a photon gas. What you call as a Big Bang in cosmology is you start with a photon gas. 
around I mean, okay, around hundreds of millions of degrees, around that scale. It's not the gravitational big bang like you start with okay a singularity and then you start developing. No, and this is what here big bang cosmology means. The cosmology big bang is essentially uh, a photon gas, okay, around hundred GeV or uh, hundred MeV or something, okay, and then you start evolving the universe essentially with all the interactions, all the particles. So at that energies, you only have one particle, essentially electron and photons. So you have a gas of electrons and photons. And then you start forming matter. So they form light element loops. So this is called Big Bang cosmology. And when the entire cosmology was over, those photons just stayed back because the universe has expanded so fast, essentially. So some of these photons have wavelengths which are very, very, very large. Very, very large. And so they become extremely low temperatures essentially. And they sort of decouple as the universe cool, they decoupled at certain temperature. Let's say they decoupled at certain temperature, which is very, very low. Okay. And you can measure the present day cosmic wave microwave background temperature, which is um, well known to Now, this background is uh, very important because you see how this background is. You sit at the center of the, uh, the earth and measure how this background is. And you find it to be this background is uniform. So, if you measure this background here and you measure this background here, then the same temperature, the same polarization is similar. Roughly, roughly. Okay. They had the same temperature. This is what led to the advent of inflation and everything. This tells you that the universe, when it was forming, was completely isotropic and uniform. Homogeneous isotropic universe. Okay. That is the reason why the universe when it formed was homogeneous and isotropic. And when the universe started forming, essentially our structure started forming, the photons decoupled. Okay. So the photons, when the photons decoupled, But then, people started looking at small, small temperature variations in practices. Okay, so these are called anisotropic. So you look at delta T by T at distances at various patches. You get anisotropic at various patches and you map the entire sky. So if you look at Planck data, you will see nice maps, beautiful maps. I can't make much sense out of them, but they look very beautiful. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, they have green patches, red patches, so on, so essentially, a lot of patches, essentially, so much more dots and green patches. So, the satellite called Kobe, okay, okay. this was even before my time, but when I, even when I was doing PhD, I, my supervisor was publishing papers on Kobe. So, Start to see variations of the order of 10 power minus 5. These temperature variations can be mapped into density variations. They can be mapped into density variations. So they can be mapped into the temperature variations. So from this, you can do some spectrum analysis. You can do some spectrum analysis of this data. And which tells you how much amount of variance are matter is present in the universe, how much amount of total matter, how much amount of it is that much of the You can do that, and when you do that, okay, uh, so the spectrum analysis, so you, you must have seen this spectrum analysis, okay? this very famous uh, power spectrum analysis, essentially, of uh, WMAP and Planck and everything, so they will tell you, this gives you way on this field, the ratio of this gives you matter density and so on, so this gives you all this. But anyway, <coughs> if you want, I recommend Lord and Sir. Look into Lord and Sir, actually, you can get more details. Actually. So, from this, you can get, get what is the matter density. Okay? The matter density, which is the density. Comes out to be one or better way to write essentially omega matter or omega. Okay. Although omega matter is around 0.3, or 
and of which 4% is variable. So visible matrix is usually 4%, 4 to 6% or something like that. Rest of it is all dark. Okay. So of which omega variable is around here. And then Yeah, visible means which interacts with photons. Very obvious. Essentially. Visible in the sense if they interact with photons. They can interact with photons. That's the most important thing. Something which doesn't interact with radiation is you cross see it. So this is the visible matrix. So this information again told you that there is a large amount of dark matter. Now you know what is matter density in the universe. The total amount of mass dark matter present in the universe, you know. We have a large number. We have now have a number for the total amount of dark matter in the universe. So earlier you didn't have a number. You only had a signature, essentially, that there is dark matter, now is there dark matter. But now you have a quantifiable number for the total amount of dark matter in the universe. This is a very big step. Now, if you build any model, we check whether that model is valid with this number. We can test the dark matter. Okay. <coughs> so this started with this number, started with Kose, and now with Planck. With Planck, it has become super precise. For the first time, cosmology is entering precision cosmology. It has become super precise. So this is expressed as okay, omega x okay, is around 0.8. Okay, in some units, okay. Uh, so let me write dark matter essentially should be this is sufficient. Omega dark matter is around 0.8. Okay, let me do this first. So this is the your number, you know the number, you know what is the critical density of this. You know, present day number. So, what is the total matter in the universe? You know it. From this, you can tell total energy density of the universe. From this, you can tell how much percent there is dark matter. So, it is like I said, six times more than visible matter. So, you need to explain a particle. You need to have a particle which is six times more abundant than all our standard model particles, all our particle particles. Okay. All our standard model particles, which should be stable, which should be stable, which should not interact, okay, which should be chargeless. <coughs> okay. Now, one final thing, one more evidence for. Dark matter comes from uh, now this energy density also has to be cold. Cold in the sense that uh, when you have, uh, it should be non intrusive If you want, in the simplest manner, I can tell you that it should be non intrusive Okay, it should be, its temperature should be very very low compared to uh, it's called relic essentially compared to the cosmic microwave. Uh, it should be cold. It should not be in thermal. Okay, so there is also one more evidence coming from large scale structures. I am not an expert on this, but uh, I just mentioned. That if you want small perturbations, so if you start with small density perturbations, you write down a bunch of equations essentially. So uh, you start with the plasma equations essentially, like the earlier years, you start with photon gas, electron gas, and then you start with the small density perturbations. If these density perturbations should grow and in the normal domestic regime it should start forming structures, okay, it should start forming structures. Then you should have, you 
need to have a large amount of cold dark matter. Cold dark matter is also important. I mean, cold dark matter completely non reducing not fast moving, stationary sort of matter should be present if you want to build structures in the world. If you want to build structures, starting, it is not shown, okay, there are some expressions, but this is mostly done by numerical solutions. If you want to uh, do, uh, build numerical uh, structures, in the, starting with uh, some gas, okay, some random classical gas, and do a remote simulation and start looking for structures. So instead of various inertial variables, inertial variables, one means uh, cold. So when uh, there are some simulations which combine everything with cosmology, plus large scale structure and something. So especially when you want to be kind of more. Um, uh, okay. Um, so but independent of those things, just from forming of structures, you need to have cold up. You need to have cold up as an as an initial condition when you want to form structures in all the simulations. How will it become cold without any cold? Uh -huh. well, as the universe expands, the temperature of the particle also drops. It's purely because of expansion. It's purely because of expansion. And it has to decouple from the world. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll do it in the next class essentially. So you start with a, again, a hot gas with some temperature. As the universe expands, the Gas starts cooling. Gas starts cooling, essentially. And this particle should not be in thermal equilibrium with this gas. At some point, it should come out of equilibrium with this gas. It should fall off naturally out of this gas. Okay? If it is annihilated, it should annihilate essentially. It should, it should annihilate or decay. Okay? Let's just assume this. So you saw something called a Boltzmann sequence. And then you can show that at certain temperature, when uh, uh, depending upon its mass, it becomes non relativistic because essentially its kinetic energy is proportional to the temperature because when it's in the equilibrium. But you want, you don't want it to be in thermal equilibrium all through the universe. It has to come out of thermal equilibrium because when it's in thermal equilibrium, uh, what happens is its density falls very rapidly with respect to its mass. So, essentially, if you just look at uh, um, it, falls off as e power minus mv if you want. If it is in thermal equilibrium, the density falls off. So, you want it to be uh, so called feasible. I'll do it next time, I'll explain it to you. And it's going to be but, but as the universe expands, it becomes colder. Okay, as the universe expands, depending upon its interactions, depending, I cannot give you a general answer, but depending upon its interactions, okay, it can remain in equilibrium or it can go out of equilibrium. Depending upon its mass and depending upon its interaction. So these particles are coming together. Uh, if it is dark matter, say for example. If it is, uh, we'll take an example in which some two particles annihilate, uh, a particle comes, meets its own self, annihilates, and goes to some other new particles, so for example, standard mode particles or something. Okay. That is essentially the so called thermal dark matter. So when you do that, uh, so after a certain time, depending upon its mass, it, it should not remain in equilibrium. So you can manage that uh, after its mass is of certain order, and if its cross section is of certain order, if its cross section is of certain order, it can fall out of thermal equilibrium, it will not participate in thermal equilibrium, and its number density freezes, 
As the universe is expanding, its number will not change. That's called Fizzo. The number density of it will just remain as as it is, but the universe keeps expanding. So the density is decreasing, but the total number, energy density of it will remain the same. So then it becomes colder and colder and colder. So it cannot be in thermal equilibrium with, uh, uh, with CMB because the CMB is very, very cold. And if it is in thermal equilibrium with that, the, the relative density would be very, very small. It is suppressed, like I said, E power minus M2 essentially. So it will be very, very small. So it cannot explain the observed relative density, which is around 0.25%. So it should have enough abundance but at the same time, it should come out of equilibrium because it should not be in equilibrium all through the expansion of the universe. So it should something called freeze out. Meaning, freeze out means its number density freezes. It just stops evolving. The number density stops evolving and remains constant. Uh, um, and we do it next class. So anyway. Uh, In addition to billions, one also needs uh, cold dark matter to actually have um, um, a large scale structure. So, with all these features, are there any particles in the standard model which can be dark matter? No, only one particle standard star which can be. Okay. For example, gauge bosons are not stable, muons are not stable, stars are not stable, they are all charged. Okay. H bosons decay, Higgs boson decays. So none of them can be, within the standard model, none of them can be dark matter except neutrinos. Except neutrinos, none of them can be standard model. Okay? So if you look at all the leptons and quarks, so you will be, let's just write first two generations, you will be, because all the other ones are unstable. W bosons, gauge bosons, all of them are unstable. You can forget about all of them. Okay. The only thing which is stable, things are always unstable. The okay. only thing which are roughly stable are the in energy in terms of neutrons and quarks. And at all the limits, and at all the Okay, then there is mu 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 tau. These are charged, so we rule them out. This is barrier dark matter, these are also ruled out. So that gives us a little neutrons. Neutrons can be dark matter in principle. Neutrons can be dark matter, but their masses are very low. So their masses are around 1 million, roughly 1 million. Okay, very light. So if their masses are very light, they are almost, almost, especially when the structure is forming, little bit of temperature is sufficient to make them very fast. Little bit of temperature is sufficient. Okay, they can be very, very fast. So they, instead of uh, being cold dark matter, they start uh, being free streaming and so they don't form structure. Okay? And so neutrons, two reasons, free stream. I'm using some technical words, but believe me that they don't form all it means that they don't allow the structure to form. Large scale structure to form. Second thing is sum of neutral masses is very, very small. Very, very small to satisfy the energy. Okay. So, at some point, maybe in later on lectures, when I discuss some examples, I discuss some examples of warm dark matter in certain cases. Where neutrons will come back, those kind of neutrons are different. They are called sterile neutrons. So, some sterile neutrons can form the warm dark matter. We'll come to that. So, you need, if you want to satisfy warm dark matter, they should be of the order of at least. Hundreds of KAB or KAB. Okay, so at the end of the day, what we established today was that there is dark matter, and none of the standard model particles have dark matter like features. So, because they are not stable, or if they are stable, they are neutral, their masses are not in the right range, okay, or they are always charged. So, we <coughs> are going to look for a dark matter candidate. <laughs> so next class, what I'll do is uh, uh, I'll.
I'll do one more part of the dark matter, which is called Wings. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Wings? You guys can forget about Okay. <laughs> you guys know the Wings, but you guys are familiar with Rajesh knows, so you know? You don't know Wings. You know. You, know. you don't know. You don't know. You don't know. You know the name. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay. So we we'll do some good. Okay, one minute. We'll just revise the names a little bit and then we will move on. We'll go to some simple topics. Very, very important uh, feature. Okay. And then we'll look at some examples of dark matter. Okay. I mean, isn't this something we should already explain? No, no, there is gravity. Dark matter has gravity. No, no, no. In this dental model, we don't have gravity and we are making the observation. The observations are not much gravitation. Yeah. Uh, but all the sandwich particles participate in gravity field interactions. Right? Yeah. Should we also not land on something? Yeah. Yeah, those are ideas also there. But the, in the beginning, I wrote something. No? I wrote that particle interpretation of dark matter. So it should be some particle. Basically, is that it should be some particle. It's not some molecular gravity or something. It's some fluid, but the fluid should be made up of something. But we don't. It is not just modification of uh, gravity. Modification of gravity is not going to be. But uh, I mean, when we are adding this new particle into our chemistry, should we also not include gravity also? I mean, uh, no, if the the point is that if it, that particle uh, can have mass, then it's susceptible to gravity. If it, it just has mass, okay. What interactions it, it? So the moment it has mass, it participates in gravitational interaction. That's only the rating here which gravitational interaction is using. Whether we should add explicitly gravitational interactions to these particles, generally in general relativity, the uh, gravitational interactions go through T mu. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you add through T mu, mm -hmm. these are very very small energy. It depends upon the time. MC momentum tensor is essentially mass. Mm -hmm. So this is what maximum what you have a G E. So it will be very very light, whereas gravity will become strong only at M plant. Mm -hmm. So T by M plant was expression and the, those effects will be highly suppressed. Though I should say that yes, in general we don't have to write these terms because they are highly suppressed. We control them more. But there could be some special cases which people are exploring, especially in which the coupling could be non-minimal. This is called a minimal coupling, what I wrote, T minimal coupling. In certain cases, um, there will be a non-minimal coupling. Meaning the coupling can be very, very large, so as to compensate this G implied by energy. So that energy, that, that coupling can be 10 power 6 or something, such a, such a pretty large. So, but those are weird models, we don't have to worry about it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying, they are very special cases. But in general, if you just write gravitational couplings to any of the standard model particles, and looking at energies at our scale, T, V, G, V or something, those interactions are highly suppressed by mass of the particle by Roughly the energy of the interaction by M plant. So those effects would be minimal. So that way you should ask why you are not adding gravitational interactions for neutrons, protons, and everything, right? For even quarks and mass. We are seeing them in visible. Okay, we are seeing them in visible such sectors, right? That means it, it doesn't mean that they don't have gravitational interaction. They have gravitational. They are falling, they are participating in black holes, they are participating in, they are forming jets, they are in very, very strong gravitational environments, with very, very strong magnetic fields and stuff like that. Why are you not writing them? You should write them because unless the classical background is very, very strong, unless you are in the background of black hole or something, you don't care actually. In certain cases, if you are very close to the center of the galaxy or something, you have to worry about these effects.
there the even stars move very close to the speed of light. So, yeah. Otherwise, you don't have it. General TV is very, very small. Mm -hmm. But in dark medium, we like invisible to the standard model, right? Because it need not be. I'll give you an example. Neutrons need not be invisible to the standard model. They participate in neutrons. So weak interactions is allowed. For that point? Yes. Oh, cool. Weak interactions is allowed. Because neutrons participate in weak interactions. OK? And uh, it should have lattice interactions. It cannot have automatic interactions. I didn't mention it, but it cannot have strong interactions. There is enough data to tell you that it cannot have strong interactions. So if it has participates in strong interactions, it contributes to the virion density. There are, like, there are examples now. If somebody is picky, they can push me that, oh, no, no, you're, there could be some some strange quark, strange nuggets. Or some, there are some examples in which you can have very early, but it looks like a dark one. If you push me too hard, I'll give you that also. But, <laughs> okay. yeah. but since you are not doing referring of papers and stuff like that, we don't have to worry about it actually. If somebody is, we are not writing a paper, so we can talk collectively. If you are writing a paper, you had mentioned the paper. Yeah, there is a possibility that, you know, yeah, some examples are there. There could be strange, it's massive stars, a Jupiter like star. But they are all ruled out. Many of them matches. They are all ruled out. Then there are some other effects like topological effects. And, okay, those can also have experience. So there are something called Gibbs zillas, <laughs> which are around 10 power 30 G, 10 power close to Planck scale, 10 power 14 G, super huge atoms. So that matter, actually, the mass is not. So the range is from 10 power minus 32 to 10 power minus 18. <laughs> All that range is allowed actually. <laughs> the lowest I know is 10 power minus 32 or something, which is that fuzzy dark matter or some such thing actually. Okay, so you can do uh, So it's uh, just about 50 to 60 watts of magnitude. Okay, it's, <laughs> so one has to think. So in particle physics, right now we are worried about 10 GeV, 20 GeV, or something, 1 GeV, 2 GeV. We miss that Higgs mass by 10 GeV in that. So, these people have to worry about 50 orders of magnitude, actually. So. Yes. Everything is possible in that matter. So, I'll see you on Thursday. Okay. So, we do winks and uh, maybe we remove the strong signal from our time frame. Maybe next week or something, I'll start super symmetry. Start with super symmetry. Super symmetry fine, or do you want me to start extra dimensions? <laughs> okay, and do super symmetry. Okay, that is a canonical thing. I'll try to finish in 10 15 lectures. I'll do it in easy. I won't go into the all the detail, going details. But it's fantastic.